Thank you, Stefan. Dear colleagues, my task is to uh, uh, point at a couple of practical issues. And uh, the first slide, I try to get it. Maybe you can upload it. Can you load the, the slides? Can we see them here? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we are. Okay, this is my task. So I begin with this anecdote, and uh, when uh, actually I owe this to Charles Abrams of uh, Penn State. Uh, so when Nixon met uh, Ju and Lai, and this is an example how long it takes for a pickup of a drug or perhaps something else, uh, then Nixon asked uh, Ju and Lai, what do you think? on the effect of the French Revolution of 1789 on society. And then uh, Zuen Lai answered, it's too soon to know. <laughs> so this is the Chinese philosophy. The American philosophy is try a new method and jump. This is, of course, this is Dick Fosbury uh, and his new technique. So my uh, conflicts of interest seem balanced. Uh, my agenda, I propose to look at the long-term data. I focus on the GI bleed paradox, if you wish, uh, because the long-term data were somewhat in contra contra uh, contradiction to the, uh, to the study data. And second, at which TTR should we not switch? This is a constant discussion. And I feel this is enough for today. We have other issues for the discussion maybe later. So this one you know. So it's about two and a half years that we know from the study from Dabiga Trend that it did better than its comparator in the higher dose. So it was extended and about, and you see the numbers at the bottom. And unfortunately, the laser pointer is not working. Do you have another laser pointer? Uh, we're working it through. So you see on the bottom the ones that survived and were in included still uh, in the study of continuation. And it went on for about five years. And you see the stroke incidences. Uh, it was about 1.25 per year for the higher and 1.5 per year uh, at, for the lower dose. And this was kind of expected. The major bleedings continued as well. Uh, and uh, so it seems even to uh, enlarge the difference. In the major bleeds were higher in the, uh, uh, in, here we go, in the higher dose and lower in the lower dose. And that continued. And you see the data, like 3.3 and 2.8%. Uh, uh, per year as the incidence over like five years. And the IC bleeds, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, it was not continued with the warfarin arm, and you see that it continued sort of expected. It did not level off, though. It could have been that the selection of patient could have uh, allowed the even lowering, but it sort of went straight ahead, and it was 0.3 and 0.2 per year, which is much lower than in the warfarin arm, also in other studies. So, but the body count, if you wish, the mortality was exactly the same. So uh, why is this? Uh, maybe we have to individualize. So the bottom line is that the high bleeding risk needs the lower dose, the high stroke risk needs the higher dose. We need to individualize because this mortality rate is, always, is exactly the same uh, curves. So we have 
data, we have long-term data, we have registration issues, and uh, it is, of course, important to have post-marketing report. And uh, the FDA Mini Sentinel was important because there were reports on even higher bleeding incidences in the press on Dabigatran, and this was then uh, analyzed in the F FDA uh, report. And you see also in the study, as Jan pointed out, that the higher dose of Dabigatran has a signal of uh, gastrointestinal bleeds as well as in the river Oxaban, perhaps in the milder forms of uh, bleeding, perhaps in the one who developed polyps and colonic carcinoma, uh, uh, but the others did not have this uh, signal, so it was worthwhile to look at it in more detail. And if you look at the additional data of the study on Dabigatran, you see that uh, the, it is more the uh, lower intestine, the, the colonic bleeds. You see the warfarin is like 25% of the lower GI bleeds and uh, uh, in dabigatrin it's 20% more, uh, very consistent in both ways, su such as uh, supporting the issue that the active drug is in the colon and may uh, accelerate some uh, bleedings there. And quite surprisingly, the, uh, the Southworth report came out in the New England recently and showed that it is rather lower, the bleedings, with a large number of patients that were followed, 10,000 patients, and the incidence, it's a little unfamiliar with 100, per 100,000 days at risk, so I sort of calculated in our percent per year. Uh, so it's 0.5 in the dabigatran and 1.1 uh, in the warfarin, so it's the other way around, and this is quite uh, unusual, whereas the intracranial bleeds were similar as we are used to in the studies, 0.25 in the dabigatran and 0.8 uh, in, the, uh, in the warfarin group. Why this is the case is subject of discussion. There are a couple of issues that we can discuss. Uh, of course, the uh, reporting uh, of the IC bleeds may be more consistent than the GI, which is milder usually. There could be a selection bias. There could be more warfarin naives. So that means that they're more subject to bleeds. There may be other issues. Maybe Dr. Holmes can uh, extend on that in his uh, talk, what his opinion is. At least this is good news, in fact, for the, for the drug, and not, it's not fully understood. So, beginners are dangerous, and I wanted to point out these practical issues. If you start anticoagulation, that is a good point that Jan made, then you should consider the nuance particularly, because the running in phase is dangerous. And, and, and this is an uh, overview that was published three years ago in the archives, and you see the 30 days to begin with was extrapolated with 14 uh, 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 severe, 14 percent severe bleeds per year, extrapolated per year, and then it tap it's tapering down to 10 percent in the 90 days and 7 percent in the first half years, and it, it's leveling off, but it's not really uh, relaxing to see that it's still 6 percent in, the, in, the, in, in registers. So, warfarin beginners and eight, uh, uh, the, the octogenarians are dangerous, and they, the begin, can profit from the new ones because they don't have this agony of uh, uh, installation. So at which TTR not to switch? This is my second or third topic that I wanted to show you. This is the landmark paper by Ellen Heilek, who showed that the increase, uh, the steep increase of IC bleeds with increasing uh, TTR or e increasing INR, or it, uh, in, uh, in, it's, it's increasing not only linearly so, but exponentially. So this is 1994. And what were the TTRs in the studies? As you can see, it's between 55, 64, and 66. You can argue the sicker the patients are, and they had a chats vas score that was higher here, the, the, the more difficult this, uh, it is to get a good TTR. Meta-analysis in the United States of, age, uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation patients are even lower, anticoagulation clinics too, substantially better sometimes. And this is an overview which I liked very much from uh, 
this is the editorial that accompanies this by Gregory Lipp. So warfarin may not be warfarin. And can warfarin do better? And uh, the study is about uh, patients. It's a registry in Great Britain uh, which covers the risk of stroke and mortality associated with suboptimal anticoagulation or optimal anticoagulation by Gallagher. And uh, this study included 20, a registry of 27,000 warfarin treated patients. And uh, you look at the mortality according to the TTR achieved. And uh, you see the, th this is the endpoint stroke and the curves without stroke. Over 70% TTR, you land over time, this is the month, over five, six, and seven years, uh, you land in the range of 80, 90, 93% remain without stroke, whereas in the poor group, it is 75, so it's a difference of 20%. Uh, percent. And this group of practitioners achieved in England, a uh, registry like a good 36. That's pretty good. And uh, actually, we have the data from Active W investigation uh, already five years ago. And I can, uh, what was then the low range of a benefit? And the conclusion was by then very interesting for centers and countries. I read it to you a target threshold exists. And it is estimated between 58 and 65, below which there appears to be little benefit of oral anticoagulation of uh, over anti, and this was dual antiplatelet therapy that it was compared to. So you see the range that we need uh, to achieve, and this illustrates it. If you if you take the the good group with more than 65 percent TTR. There you get this difference that we would like to see in terms of outcome. And if you take the bad group lower than 65, there seems no difference. And this is uh, easily forgotten. And uh, you can see that the registries, uh, these, these are North American registries, essentially are 50, uh, between 49, 42, 60. So they're in a range that is very critical. And is probably sometimes less than double antiplatelets, for instance. And if you look at the RELY studies, uh, study, there you kind of see this confirmed, although not statistically uh, significant, this intuitively, you see the ones, the centers that have a poor anticoagulation, less than 57 TTR, they seem to profit much more from Dabigatran 150 as opposed to the other two. Whereas the good centers with more than 70% TTR, it seems strikingly different. How about the bleeding? Same thing. If you're poor in anticoagulation, uh, warfarin bleeds much more than Dabigatran. If you're pretty good, then it's a it's here, it's here, that, that warfarin arm. So it seems suggestive Then the better you do, whether it's a marker or whether it's causative, so we can discuss, but uh, the better you do, the, the better is the outcome. And uh, Sweden can do it. So this is the Auricula cohort, and these are all centers in Sweden. And the best comes in the range to 100, 90%, and the, the worst is the best from those I showed you before. So it can be done. It can be done. Whole Sweden. And Sweden has a lot of old age people. Sweden had a lot of drinkers, if you wish. And Ellen Heilek showed this before. If you manage to do it in a therapeutic range, then you can achieve the intracerebral bleeds that are exactly in the range that I showed you with Dabigatran, and they are sometimes even lower in the stroke range uh, uh, if, you, if you have the Swedish results. Well, I, in summary, are they here to stay? I believe so. We have long-term data. We have millions of patient years. Uh, the GI bleeds are, in this, in this time, 
uh, not more frequent outside the studies. And if you achieve a TTR in the range of 65 or 70 percent, there is in this group not the full evidence now to switch. And I recommend the reading of this Europace article, a good checklist, a very practical good checklist following up contacts of AFib patients on anticoagulation, what to check in your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.